So today I want to talk a little bit about and finish this series, but I thought it would be important to bring a little history to bear and to, to, to affirm. The other thing I want to do is affirm Mike and Marsha's willingness to trust 50 or 60 renegades who believed in them at a time when they didn't even know what, what end was up or if the world was coming or going. And we, we just knew that this church needed to happen. More importantly, we knew that the message needed to go out. And, and apparently God agreed with us. And 18 years later, we're, we're looking at our first building. And so that's a praise to the Father for his love. But I want to talk with you a little bit about, I just want to make sure I'm clicking here at the right. I want to talk with you a little bit about making sense of submission in the context of what we're going to read. Let me read the verse. Now, I have to tell you now, Mike, Mike asked me to preach this thing. Is it a coincidence he asked me to preach on slaves? Because I don't really see no other people in here that could do this. <laughs> That's a troubling thing. And Randy, Grant, Randy's niece usually brings a little color with her. You know, she ain't even here today. Well, let's talk about it. Paul's writing and he's finishing off this book, Ephesians. And it's probably short of Romans, the place where grace is spoken of the most. So much so that it's one of the books we endorse in terms of uh, doing a Bible study and stuff like that. So Paul's talked with, he's talked about unity and harmony, walking in purity, walking in victory, and he's described in, in chapter 3, he's described this thing we'll read about who God is and what he's done for us. And then, and then in 5, he starts this out with, submit you one to another out of reverence to Christ. And then he starts to teach us how. Now, I'm not so sure it's so much a how because the stuff he asked us to do, the stuff he asked me to do as a husband, the stuff he asked my children to do as children, the stuff he asked me to do as a father, and you'll hear this morning the stuff he asked me to do as a slave or an employee, very difficult to accomplish based on strong-willed determination. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you that none of that stuff is possible to happen. But let's look at what he says to slaves, and then I'll paint a little picture of who he was talking to, and then we'll get into it. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that it is he who is both their master and yours in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. No favoritism with him. As an overview... I want to take a look at where we're going to go. I'm going to talk a little bit about slaves obey. So pause. It's saying you need to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And he says to slaves a couple of things. You need to obey. You need to serve from the heart. 
and do the will of God. And then he says to the masters, uh oh. Yeah, it says the masters do the same. I was doing some homework on this, so I was trying to figure out slaves. Now, here's my question. Any, raise your hand if you think, think about this. Why did he give women, children, and slaves such a burden to bear? Anybody have problems with slaves obey your masters? You can raise your hand. That's your part, right? Anybody have a problem with that? Any pro- anybody have a problem with children honor your parents? You should, because that's hard to do if my parents have been dishonorable. Any of you have, now I could get myself in trouble here, trouble with wives submit or husbands love? You should, because nobody does that well. Sherry already, you know, we know how it goes in her house. Sherry says. Aristotle said, I don't know if this is going to show up, Aristotle said, a slave is nothing more than a living tool, like a tool is a non-living object, right? A slave back in those days. I found out that in some places, 30% of the population were slaves. And in some cases, 50%, one out of every two people was a slave. There were typically three classes of slaves, there were the lifetime slaves. We, 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 you, I want you to think about the people that are low status, low income, usually characterized by derogatory slurs. I was actually going to put a list up here of, of uh, derogatory slurs, but when I thought about my crowd, it wouldn't have been fun. There's very few for Norwegians and Swedish people. And German folks, very few. There's a whole lot for people of color. And they got them broke down to tribes and stuff. I went on Google. I Googled it. I want you to think about, I'm going to say some words that are typically offensive to me. Words we would use like nigger, spit, kite. Those are the, those are the first class of people. They were people that were lifetime uh, generations of folks, moms and grandmas, who had been oppressed because of some difference, maybe. Then there were another group of slaves, and they were the conquered folks. So if the Romans conquered America, we would be slaves. And so as a consequence, there were slaves who were doctors, teachers, nurses, professors, Psychologists, neuroscience, neuro- neuroscientists, all kinds, plumbers, and they had been conquered. And so they assume a role as a slave. And then thirdly, there was a class of people that were called slaves who owed me money. Randy owes me a couple hundred thousand, and he says to me, Jay, I'll, I'll come live at your house and work it off, and Lisa will come with me. And so, as a family, they become slaves. I'm not so sure that the, the last two classes is who Paul was talking to. In the church in Ephesus, there were husbands and wives, children and parents, and there were slaves and masters. And, and a large majority of the slaves were either people who were have-nots, Tools, laborers, they weren't people, they weren't considered people, or they were conquered and they weren't considered people. And before Christianity, slave owners did anything they had to do to a slave because slaves allowed the Romans to eat, drink, and be merry, eat, drink, and, and indulge in a all kinds of pleasure. And and so women and children and slaves were disposable, especially if they got in the way of that or didn't provide a way for that. So he's saying 
to the lowest group on the totem pole. Some crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Now, I have a heritage of, of in America being, being a, um, called to obey. God's calling us to obey, and I wrote up here, be open, give submissive ear. The word for obedience is this notion of this. I don't even know if I can do it, but just pretend I'm on one knee. That's the position. Give obedience. So Paul's saying, obey. And when he says obey, he's asking slaves to have three things. Single-minded devotion. He says obedience comes because you have one love, one master, one authority in your life. Fear and trembling is this notion. The words there are this focus. I got one purpose. And he's calling the slaves. Not, he's saying, serve your master, but give your service as an offering to the Father. So the master is a vehicle for me to worship, to honor my maker my creator. But he's asking a slave to do that. Secondly, he's asking that you not only give honor, fear, and trembling to the master, but you do so with a sincere heart. with an authentic heart, with a heart that whose purpose is to love and honor one thing, sincerity, and not, not serving, not obedience. So I get to smile or I get to, I get to check. Now, I think Paul was thinking about two things. What's the best way to ask a slave to serve in a way that may transform the system? But he is also thinking because I don't think he was trying to change the culture. He was going to use the culture and change it from the inside. You can't change the culture if you're dead. So, single purpose, sincerity are qualities that have survival value. See, in the African-American culture, in our town, in our state, in our country, the person responsible for the preservation of race was the moms. And they did the same thing. That's why in my community, African-American moms are notorious for harsh parenting practices. Why? Greer and Cobbs, in a book called Black Rage, described it for me for the first time, written in 1965. And what he said was, the moms were responsible for shaping young men so they would live a long time. So if a 14-year-old young man asserts himself in an oppressive system, what happens? He's dead. He's dead. And so the moms develop these practices of harsh discipline in an attempt to break their son's will so that they would be more submissive. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about submissive. He's saying, honor God by honoring your master, even if he is a beanhead. I was going to say something else, but I wasn't going to say that. Okay? He's also saying, be sincere.
And then thirdly, he's saying, know that your purposed, sincere devotion to the master indirectly in is really an offering to the Father. And that the way you want to change the system can happen because of how you behave and how, you, how your attitude is. This isn't just about behavior. It's more about internally making an adjustment. Now, I'm saying to you, I, I, I didn't grow up in a slave system. I'm looking at Paul. I, I looked at this passage and said, what are you talking about? You asking me. And Paul would look at me and say, yeah, I am. I am. I'm asking you to, I'm asking you to behave differently. Not only does he ask us to obey, but he wants us to serve from the heart. So he's asking two things of the slaves, obey and heart service. and, And how do you spell that out? He's saying, I want you to serve lovingly. I want you to do service with God the Father's love for you in mind. You say, well, but but what if the the master is a jerk? Because back in that day, he could be. I was reading somewhere, slave master had a servant killed because the, kid, the, the, the slave accidentally killed a, a pigeon. And he had him put away. See you. Didn't exist. And Paul's calling us to serve lovingly. And then he's saying, I want you to serve with liberty freely. I don't want you to serve with the notion that you may or may not get anything from the master. Now, he's going to later on point to the fact that loving service, obeying and serving from the heart is recognized and seen by the Father. But he's calling the servants, the bond servants, to a different way of living. And then he thirdly says, serve the Father. At a church called Open Door, they would say, you're getting your life from work, or you're getting your life from your wife, or you're getting your life from your husband, or you're getting your life from addiction, or you're getting your life from something. But if you use that phrase, Paul's calling the slaves to get their life from the Father only, getting their life from the Father. Now, now I have a a response to this. Do you have the same response? I'm telling you. I would look at Paul and say, you know what? You can take your letter and put it somewhere. Because first of all, I ain't wired that way. Second of all, that ain't, on my, that ain't on my computer program. That's not on my computer program. I'm saying that everything I just told you, left to human will, left to a heart, as Jay said, who doesn't want the bad and only wants the good, we ain't wired for it. It's mission impossible. But then I was reminded in Ephesians, let's read a little bit. Why would Paul say something like that? See, I don't believe this was orders. I think Paul was making a prediction. I think Paul was making a prediction. I think he was making a prediction that said, if you come to understand the Father's commitment to you, you come to understand that he loves you, that he sees you, that he's sensitive to you, that he's gentle with you. If you come to understand love, you can't help it. 
This is what you're going to look like. This is what you're going to look like. Love will transform you. I mean, I have an example of when I first became a Christian. I, before I was a Christian, work, well, let me just say this. It was a means to an end that I claimed to be very efficient at. I did as little as possible for as much as I could do. Now, some of you laugh because you think just like I did, okay? I did as little as possible to get as much as I could do and have the poorest attitude while I was doing it. You better not be telling me, what you think I'm mopping? You got to be kidding me. I had a poor attitude, and it was quiet. I would walk around gremlin. I became a Christian in 1980. Now, here's the problem. I became a Christian. I didn't want nobody to know. So I came home because I didn't want to be called one of them Jesus freaks. And I don't want anybody to accuse me of trying to convert them. So I carried a little Gideon Bible in back pocket. You would never see me read it because I only read it when I was on the bus when nobody cared about it. And I read it all the time. I didn't go to church because my family went to the Catholic church. I went to the Catholic church, but I didn't, I didn't go to church for myself. But something changed. I had a job working as a janitor, which means I'm vacuuming and picking up trash cans and wiping off tables. And that summer, something changed. And I said, I'm going to work as hard as I can work. I don't care who's here. So one day I'm pushing my vacuum with my earphones on, bebopping to my music. Back in the day, that was a big old CD player, you know, not a little one, big old giant CD player that you had to strap on. And I'm just listening to my music. And a guy comes up to me and he says, hey, Jay, come here, man. I said, what you want, man? I'm just trying to work here. He said, you one of them, ain't you? I said, what? One of what? He said, like I'm looking at Arden, he said, you a Christian, ain't you? Now, I'm trying to be incognito. I said, uh, uh. What makes you ask? Because <laughs> I wasn't going to say nothing. He said, I could tell by the way you work. Now he's talking to me. The dude who would work as little for as much with bad attitude. I could tell by the way you work. I said, well, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean? Because I was trying to figure out what was showing. Like, you know, my pants hanging out or something. What's showing? You know, he said, I give you stuff to do. You just do it. You don't complain. And you do you do." You go the extra mile. Now, I wish I could tell you I plan that. That's how I do. That ain't how it worked. That's because God changed me. I'm telling you it's impossible. Let me read to you what Paul says. In Ephesians 3, 16, he says this. That out of the treasures of his glory, he may grant you the strength through his spirit in your inner being. You hear what he said? Out of treasures of his glory, he will grant you the strength and the power through the Spirit in your inner being that through faith in Christ, that through faith in Christ may dwell in your hearts love with deep roots and firm foundation you may be strong to grasp with all God's people what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ. And to know it, though it is beyond knowledge, so that you, so that you attain the fullness of being, the fullness of God himself. So, nestled back in the chapter, Paul tells us how this is going to happen. What's going to happen? These slaves are going to come into the fellowship. They're going to be taught about God's love. And almost through osmosis, God's love saturates their spirit. And it doesn't happen all of a sudden, but there'll come a time when 
somebody will say, Psst, hey, man, you a Christian? And the slave will say, yeah, man, I, I, yeah. I, 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 how'd you know? I could tell by the way you work. I could tell by the way you talk to me and deal with me. Paul was giving the instructions to slaves, whether they had Christian slaves, masters or not. The love of Christ, his commitment to you, his commitment to them. Now, we could bring this forward, those things I just described, Paul would say to those of us in 2012, guess what? How many of you raise your hand if you work for somebody? Man, he's talking to you. It's still impossible. You know, I'm getting money now, and you can't treat me any kind of way. Well, in South Dakota, you can. The right to work state, I can treat you any kind of way. But I mean, you know, I have rights. And God's calling us to the same standard. Obey your employee, and from the heart, sir, do the will of God at your job. And I'm telling you, if you got a boss, the right kind of boss, you're going to say, man, that ain't going to work because you don't understand my boss. And I'm saying to you, I'm not, I don't care about your boss. I'm asking you to gaze at God's love and his commitment to you and glance at your boss. And as you gaze at who God and the Father is, and what Jesus did to show us who the Father was, it will transform you. And you will become a more obe obeying, a more obedient, more loving, more lovingly service-oriented guy or gal. You will begin to work from your heart. See, some of us are work to live, and some of us are live to work. How many of you work to live? And it's how I work to live. I, you know, I ain't trying to, and some of you live to work, you know. And what God's calling into question is both those philosophies are whack. See, what happens is the work to live, people say, hey, man, you need to chill. You work too hard. You need to just, you know, and the, the live to work, people say, hey, man, you got to get a purpose in your life. And what, what Scripture's calling is both those philosophies are dead in the water as believers. So then he talks to the masters. Now, see, I think this is, you know, you know, I, I think this is a little weak, Paul. It's a little weak, man. All you say to the masters is do the same. Do the same. But he's saying do the same, the same thing I called the slaves to, I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to. I'm calling you out. Now, how many of you in here own your the place or have a, a managing element in the part of the work you do? I am. Okay? He's calling us out and saying there's a way to run the office that's in line with the gospel. There's a way to run an office that's in line with the gospel. We're called to have the same spirit we're called to have single devotion. We're called to, to work with sincerity. We're called to offer it to God. We're called to serve lovingly. We're called to serve freely. And we're called to get our lives, not from our employees or the way to do it right or wrong, but get our life from God the Father, Master. I, I, I like this. But lastly, I want to land on, he calls the masters to do something that's really kind of strange. He says, serve impartially. See, what happens is that the, because the masters were Roman men, they could be impartial to everybody else because they were superior. Because you own your business and you're the boss, you can operate, around, operate with an air of superiority. He's, see, when I was complaining about what he said to the masters, I didn't read that last verse. And when I read the last verse, I'm like, ouch. 
he kicked them off the pedestal. They said, hey, you, looking down at your employees, praying to God, I'm sure glad I'm not a woman or a kid or a black guy or a native guy or a Spanish guy. I'm sure glad I'm not one of them. And he said, you need to drop that. You need to drop that right now. He said, in church, in this church, in the Christian community in Ephesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, rich or poor. There's no partiality. We go all the way back to Ephesians 5.22. It says, submit ye one to another out of reverence to Christ. Reciprocal submission. And I did some homework to find out that in the, in the, in the, the ripple from this teaching changed the way we handle children, changed the way we handle women, and eventually led to the end of the overt institution of slavery. When you look at the history, it was Christians that led the charge. We don't treat kids badly. We don't treat our wives violently. We don't treat slaves. Matter of fact, as soon as even at the end of the first century, laws started to change on slaves' rights because of Christianity. So what's that mean? I'm going to call the worship team up. It means that as believers... We're employees, employers. Our job is to obey, and obedience is to give a responsive ear, a submissive ear to our employers. You may not like who they are or what they say, but their eyes aren't the eyes that give us value, God's eyes. He's calling employees to serve from the heart. Do the will of God at your job. From the heart. And if you're an employer, he's saying similar. Only he's saying, I'm the master, obey me and serve me, do my will in your job as the owner from the heart. Radically changes. Now, here's what I'm telling you this was a prediction. Come to understand the Father's love. Come to understand his commitment to us, radical commitment to us. Come to understand he gets us and he's not mad at us. And it changes you into that kind of person. Amen? All right. Say thank you. We want to say thank you for helping us make sense of what it means to submit, what it means to love from beneath. In this upside-down kingdom, You call us to do things that seem foolish to other people, but your foolishness is wisdom. It gives us life and joy. It gives us a direction. It gives us a way to live and a way to transform our world. I ask that you go out with the families today. Um, We continue to thank you for this new turn in, in Hope Community Church. We thank you for our new home and we anticipate the blessings that are going to come as we move to our new place. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.